Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of the Tiny Fibre Studio podcast. My name is Bex and this is a podcast about spinning and knitting. I will give you a heads up that right from the start this is going to be quite a purchase heavy episode. I am quite intentional about my yarn purchasing at least now, I didn't used to be, I'll come on to that in a moment, um, but I have been deliberately trying to increase the number of sweater quantities that I have in my stash. So if seeing lots of yarn purchasing is not your thing, I completely appreciate that and I will leave some links in the description to the points in the podcast where I talk about what I've been doing and achieving as opposed to just buying stuff. First of all though, let me just recap on why I want to increase the number of sweater quantities that I have in my stash. If you have watched many of the videos on this channel, you may well have come across one which is about de-stashing my yarn supplies. I did this before I moved into this house and it was one of those projects that I felt really empowered by just by looking back through my stash and going, you know what, I don't know why I bought that. It doesn't suit what I do now and I'm just gonna get rid of it. Um, that was actually really empowering to me. But one thing that I definitely noticed when I was doing that was that I have a lot of single skeins, too many single skeins really, a lot of which don't really work together and so it's not like I could do, you know, a fade or something like that with them. Um, either they're single skeins or they're really, really weird quantities that again, I don't know why I originally bought that quantity. At the moment, I am definitely much more of a sweater and large shawl knitter than I am pretty much anything else. And as much as I would dearly love to be able to stick my hand in a cupboard and just pull out an entire sweater quantity of hand spun. I'm not at that point at the moment and when I do hand spin full sweaters I try to do it quite deliberately for that particular project. So I don't have that kind of hand spun sweater stash. So this last month or so has been entirely about trying to get to a point where I have not only the yarn supplies for what I immediately want to knit, but also some ideas about yarns that I can use for the future as well. But having said that this is gonna be quite purchase heavy, I do have a finished knitted object to show you. And that is the gloves that I was working on in the last episode. I have been wearing these. I really should have taken a finished object photo before I started wearing them. But uh, I, was, I was really aware that there was another cold spell coming up and I really, really wanted to keep my fingers warm while I was on my bike going to work. And so I put in one last minute mad dash effort to get them finished. And this is what they look like. They are the Macy or Macy gloves um, by Julia Muller. Um, she is somebody who no longer publishes patterns on Ravelry, but her entire back catalogue of patterns is free. Um, basically, when there was a, a weird taxation thing for uh, digital products being sold, um, it wasn't easy for her to figure out a way of doing that. And so she just basically made everything available free, which was very sweet of her, but um, her patterns have a lot of work in them. And... It would be nice to think that she was getting some financial benefit from them. Anyway, um, these are very heavily cabled. I feel like in a lot of cable patterns that I've used previously, the cable stitch itself is kind of enclosed within a bolder box. And that mentally that helps me to sort of go, okay, that's a two stitch cable crossing to the front or a four stitch cable crossing to the back or whatever it might be. In her pattern, they were not separated by any kind of bolder line. So it was a lot harder to tell where those stitches began and end. So I found that particularly on the first glove, it was taking me a long time to do any of the cable rows 
because I was having to stop constantly and try and work out, you know, how many stitches it should be and whether it was crossing to the front or the back and so on. So that was one thing that I would change about the pattern. The other thing was that there's a point where, and I think it's where you separate for the thumb, there's a point where you have to sort of move the beginning of the round and it tells you to move stitches from the first needle but it doesn't tell you to move them from the second needle as well or vice versa I can't remember which and so that was a little bit confusing um, you would you'd move the stitches and then look at the stitch count and go well that doesn't add up and then you'd look at the stitch count for the thumb and go, oh, OK, yeah, so I should have also moved some stitches from the other needle. That just could have been a bit clearer. There were some other little bits like that that I felt were a little bit unclear, but it's a really beautiful pattern. And so I can forgive it for that. The yarn for these is Malabrigo Sock. And I'm really loving it. As I say, they do have a little bit of a halo because they have been used a little bit and they've been rained on especially in the last few days. <laughs> so they're not looking at their best right now, but they've been very functional and very pretty. So that was finished object number one. That's the knitting finished object for this episode. And I finished those just before I went to Yarnporium, which I mentioned in the previous episode. And I'm gonna run through all of the things that I not only purchased, but all the other things that I looked at and I'll try and do it in roughly chronological order. The first thing was sort of a Yarnporium purchase but not at Yarnporium and that was some goodies from Yarnistry. So Emma from Yarnistry had been really really ill in the run-up to Yarnporium and I was really hoping that she wasn't going to try and force herself to do a show when she was you know, finding it difficult to get out of bed some days. And sure enough on, I think it was the Wednesday or Thursday night, she, she did say, I'm just, I can't, I just can't do it. So she put all of her stock for the show on her Etsy shop. And so I may have placed a little order. I've been meaning to order from her for a while because she has some particular stitch markers that I was really interested in. And this is what I bought. So first thing is obviously, a flea hunter bag because Safi and Dexter at the moment. Dexter, why are you being such a flea hunter right now? <gasps> Look, give me your mouse. Where's your mouse? Come on. There we go. Right. Um, so, yeah, flea hunter bag because obviously Safi is a total flea hunter. She's actually got into a habit of chewing cushions. I came home the other night and a wool cushion cover had been chewed in all four corners at some point while I was out, along with a blanket, an acrylic blanket on the sofa, both of which have been there the entire time that these cats have lived with me and they've totally ignored them. Why suddenly they have to choose to chew th three things, I don't know. But you know, that's cats for you really, isn't it? So anyway, what I have in here are a few different stitch markers and stitch marker sets. The first one is a little set of wooden stitch markers, which are the Flea Hunter, Squisher and Sniffer stitch markers. Um, and I, <laughs> I completely love these. They are in the style of Ikea product names and it just cracks me up. As somebody who has spent quite a lot of time and money in Ikea over the years, that just amuses me. So those were, those were lovely. And then I also have a couple of sets of what I call her instructional stitch markers, which are the sets where you've got instructions like, for example, SSK or K2T for Knit Two Together. Um, that you can actually put in your work so that when you get to that stitch marker, you don't have to remember what that stitch marker means. You just do whatever's actually written on the stitch marker itself, which I think is kind of cool. So I have a gray and pink set and a gray and yellow set because often you'll need pairs of stitches. So if you're doing a sweater with increases, you would need 
two make one left and two make one right, for example. And then I also have a little set of her pink number count stitch markers. So you can either use these for um, numbers of repeats, perhaps, or more likely what I'm planning to use them for is when I'm doing cast-ons that I always find it really useful to be able to put something in to say that, okay, this is 25 stitches up to this point, or this is 50 stitches, 100, etc. So those are some cool options. And then because they were supposed to go to Yarnporium, she also had a very cute little red London bus stitch marker as well, which was um, thrown in free with any of her orders. She also did free shipping that weekend as well, which was really nice for her. It was unnecessary, but it was lovely to have that as well. So that was technically my first Yarnporium purchase, although chronologically it actually arrived quite a while after Yarnporium. Whenever I go to London, I always try, if I can, to meet up with my friend Kate, who was my knitting buddy from Yorkshire, when we both used to live up there and felt like we were completely the wrong age and demographic for the town that we lived in. Um, and when I was planning to go to Yarnporium, because it was quite short notice, I almost didn't want to text her and say, are you gonna be there on Saturday? Because I, I felt like everything was panning out so nicely that if she'd said, oh no, I'm only gonna be there on Friday, I would have been really upset. But anyway, she texted me on the Friday because she'd been talking to Katie from Black Yarns and Katie had said, oh, Bex is coming tomorrow. And so fortunately, Kate was also coming on the Saturday, which was awesome. So I joined her and the guys and girls from Loop, their knitting group, which was really nice. There was some great company there, some really good different perspectives from different people. In terms of the show itself, um, I was definitely really impressed. I would definitely go back again. There was a good mixture of vendors, mostly vendors that either produce or um, dye their own yarn. So, you know, you're, you're pretty close to the source. There were a lot fewer vendors who just resell um, other brands of yarn. And one of the really important things for me is lighting at a yarn festival. There are some yarn festivals, and I have whinged about them before, so I'm not gonna do it again, that have really terrible lighting. And it's not really the fault of the yarn show organizers, but the venue that they've chosen, which I guess in some cases is the only venue that they have available to them, just has a terrible choice of lighting. And I've actually had situations where I've stood there looking at a skein of yarn going, I literally can't tell whether this is gray or purple or blue, because there's this really horrific tint from the lighting. The great thing in the um, Central Methodist Hall is that there is just lots of natural light. So um, if you're going to an event there in the daytime, then you're able to see all of the detail of the product. So that was really, really nice. So that was the main room. And then there was also a little sort of indie showcase, which was in a room just down the corridor. And that was really nice. I did come across some vendors there that I would definitely go and look at again. One other thing is that I don't think there was a floor plan on their website. And I would really appreciate them doing that because I quite often find that when I get home, I realise that I've forgotten to take a reference photo or to jot down a vendor that was of interest to me. And I look on their website and there's no floor plan, so I don't know who that vendor was. I went on the Saturday, which was pretty quiet, I would say. Um, the group that I was with, the guys and girls from Loop, were there on both the Friday and the Saturday. And speaking to some of the vendors, they said that they definitely had a really good day on the Friday. I don't know how Saturday was for them from a, a takings point of view, um, but it was definitely quieter. So I would say that if you're somebody who struggles around large crowds or anything like that, then based on my experience this year, Saturday might be the day to go especially by half past three, four o'clock when I left, 
it was definitely quite quiet and there was plenty of space so if you're a little bit on the sort of claustrophobic side then that might be a recommendation for next year. I would also say that it was quite four ply centric. <laughs> um, I was looking for an assortment of different weights of yarn and I did find that most of it was skewed towards the four ply fingering weight end of things. And I think at a show like that, that's an autumn winter show, you probably have quite a large audience who would appreciate heavier weight yarns. And, you know, that's, again, not really to do with the organisers. That's down to the individual vendors. And they have a lot more experience in doing shows than I do. But um, for my purposes, that was something that I noticed. And I was, I definitely bought less yarn than I would have done had there been more of a variety of different yarn weights. But having said that, I did manage to buy some yarn. So let's go through that. The first thing that I really wanted some input on was my fade, because if you watch the last episode, I think I talked about this. I have these three colours of Le Biami, um Merino Singles, which I'd originally bought for Glomintide, which was as old as Mystery Knit Along in the summer. But ultimately, Glomintide and I didn't really get along. And so they ended up not being Glomintide and I re them for use in something else. So I really wanted to buy two extra skeins in order to do a fading point by Hokey Locatelli. So I basically just headed straight to a Yarn Stories booth, which was easy to do because it was literally the one of the first stands that you came to. And I basically just said to Kate, like, just, just find me something that will work in this fade. So the two that we ended up going with were these two. So these will be the darker end of the fade. And these are Piri Vo, which I actually have a skein of in the sock yarn base as well. I bought that at Edinburgh last year. It was the only um, sock skein that I allowed myself to buy. And this one is Piri Toki. So obviously those two are kind of designed to go together, but they also work really, really well with the rest of my little fade. So it's quite a subtle one, but I really like the combination of those colors. So that is gonna be my fading point by Hokey Locatelli. And yeah, thrilled with the color choice. I did actually, initially Kate picked up a different skein of Piri Vo, and I did the same as I did at Edinburgh, which was, I looked at that one and then I picked this one up and went, no, I prefer this skein. I, chances are, if you unraveled them, they would probably be pretty similar, but I don't know. There was something more speckledy about this one. The other one had um, slightly more solid sections and I felt like, this one just worked better. The next thing on my list was yarn for the Wool and Honey Sweater by Andrea Mowry, which is the one which has the hexagonal design on it. Um, it's fingering weight. It doesn't actually look like fingering weight when you see the pictures, but it is. And it has this kind of asymmetric arrangement of hexagons, which I love. And every time I see it on Instagram, I'm like, I, I need to make this thing. I looked at lots of different options and Kate, because she'd been there on the Friday, was able to just kind of bring me around to all different stands and just go, right, you need to look at this and this and this and this. And I loved all of her suggestions. I took photos of quite a few of them because they're things that I would definitely use for other projects in the future. But ultimately, ironically, I decided to go for Blackie Yarns Tamar. <laughs> It's ironic because I went all the way to London and decided to buy a yarn that is made 20 odd miles away from me. <laughs> and that I've used before in uh, my exploration station. This is actually, it's technically the same color as my exploration station, but because it's a very different dye lot, um, it is quite a significantly different color. Tamar, if you're not familiar with it, is a combination of uh, Teeswater, Wensleydale, Lester Longwool, and Cornish Mule. 
as I say, I used it on my exploration station. That thing gets a lot of wear. And while you do get a little bit of shedding, you definitely don't get much in the way of pilling. So I'm very, very happy to use this for a sweaty yarn as well. I had also said that I wanted to come back with a sweater's quantity of four ply, DK and Aran, not particularly connected to any specific project. I came away with one of those, uh, which was from Garthenor. Garthenor is one of the companies that I think of as being a little bit like Brooklyn Tweed like the, the British equivalent of Brooklyn Tweed. They are organic, so their, their whole process is certified organic, and they are very much into the traceability of their yarn. So what I ended up going with was uh, Ronus, which is Shetland. It's from Shetland. It actually says the name of the farm that it came from <laughs> on the label, so in terms of traceability. That's, that ticks that particular box. And these come in 50 gram skeins. And what I bought was basically enough to do a boxy sweater. Not that you would make a boxy necessarily from this, because I think it has too much bounce really to want to be a boxy, but it's a beautiful and very versatile option for lots of other things. As I say, I think it would work really well for a lot of Brooklyn Tweed patterns and lots of other things as well, colour work, all sorts of stuff. So I have a sweater's quantity of this and this is in the shale colourway and it's a four ply or fingering weight, two ply structure. One of the other things that I was looking for at Yarnporium was yarn to do a Mon Manet sweater which is originally designed for Le Biami Merino Aran, but I'd, I'd looked the colour that I probably would have got if they had it, they didn't have available on the website, and it also would have been really quite horrendously expensive to do it from Le Biami. There was one colourway of uh, Dreaming Colour, Dreaming Colour cassettes, which I quite liked but it wasn't it just wasn't really quite speaking to me and so I left that one and I decided to look at another option which in my case was to order from the Stranded Dye Works birthday update. So if you're not familiar with Stranded Dye Works it's Amy from the Stranded podcast it's her company and she hand dyes some rather beautiful yarns and she had actually done a Mon Manet in this colour that I had seen on her podcast and gone, I really quite like that. It's it's grey, you can't go wrong with grey, but it's also got kind of rainbow sprinkles of pretty much every other colour, um, kind of biasing towards purples, um, greens and kind of maroons. So I bought in total six skeins of this, which should be enough to do a Mon Manet. Her Mon Manet, she actually left knit side out. It's written as a pattern where you knit it with the knit side out, but then you flip it over and it's actually a reverse stocking stitch sweater. Can you get off that bag, please? Thank you. Um, so I ordered that again. That was a post Yarnporium purchase. And that order actually came with a little mini skein as well, which is very cute. Um, I don't know that there is a particular colourway to this, but it's kind of purpley pinkly, purpley pinkly, purpley pinkly, let's go with that, purpley pinkly orangey colour. So yeah, that was my, that was my order and I've actually started Mon Manet. So Mon Manet is living in my yellow field bag at the moment. So this is how far I've got with it. But there is a story behind this because I've actually knit quite a considerable amount more than it would look like I have here. Um, I've actually re-knitted this about three times. I'll come on to that in a second. But anyway, um, it's a pretty standard raglan. So there's the start of the sleeve there. Um, the body is on the needles and I'll just be knitting 
straight down from there and there's the other sleeve. Slightly raised neckline at the back and yeah so far very very happy with it once I stop screwing things up and needing to frog it and start again. <laughs> this is what it looks like from the reverse side of the stocking stitch which I just think works so brilliantly with speckled yarns. I don't know there's some there's a real difference between the knit side and the pearl side for me and the pearl side just looks awesome with these little speckles. In terms of what I was screwing up, um, great question. I have been knitting this on two skeins at a time and I wound them off onto Acorx bobbins with just one end of the bobbin attached. And I've actually been putting these on my Lazy Kate and knitting from them like this so that I'm pulling the yarn off the side of the ball and not either introducing or reducing the amount of twist. So I'm kind of testing out the same concept as the Acreworks Butterfly Kate and Hanson Crafts does a similar thing as well. Um, and it is, it is true, you know, if you do knit out of the centre of a centreable ball, you are either increasing or reducing the amount of twist. And particularly with this yarn, which is not uh, a very tight ply, I felt like that was really a useful one to be able to test it on. So I don't have an Acorx Butterfly Kate at the moment. I may get one depending on how much difference this makes because as much as I can use my Lazy Kate, um, and I definitely would for projects like this where I'm alternating skeins, it wouldn't be particularly portable for single skein items or things that you can knit a skein at a time. The reason that I'm alternating skeins is because it's hand dyed yarn and so every skein is going to be a little bit different, particularly because it's a speckled yarn and by alternating skeins you just kind of reduce the possibility of things like pooling but you also reduce the possibility of being able to see a difference between two skeins of yarn in the same project. So I was using the helical knitting method but I was finding that that was kind of confusing my brain somehow, I don't know why. It's not a difficult concept. Um, Grace from Babbles Travelling Yarns did a tutorial fairly recently, so I'll pop a link to that in the description. But essentially you knit to uh, a few stitches before the last place that you used the previous yarn, slip those stitches and then just start knitting with the other yarn. And you can't see where that change of yarns happens. So it's a much, much better method than the one where you kind of carry the yarn up the inside of the work, especially for something like this, where you're gonna be flipping it inside out. So you can't leave anything obvious on the wrong side of the work as you're working on it, because that'll eventually become the right side of the work. Confused yet? So the first time that I had to frog it, I frogged it because I wasn't happy with how I'd done that helical knitting when you initially join the new stitches for the front and actually start working it in the round. I wasn't happy with that. There was a little bit that just wasn't looking quite right. And also the cats got tangled up in the yarn and pulled it around all over the place. And yeah, it was a horrible mess. So I frogged that and I started knitting it again. I knit some of it in the room where it happens, which will only make any sense to you if you're a musical theatre geek. Um, in normal person speak, that means that I went to see Hamilton and I knitted a little bit of it while I was waiting for the performance to start. Then I took it to my knitting group on Sunday morning and I think it's one of those things where the simpler the instruction, the less your brain thinks it has to keep track and therefore the less of tension you pay. And because it was just simple raglan increases, so one round knit, one round of increases, um, I was tracking it on my knitting counter app, but for some reason when I got home, I should have had an odd number of stitches on the sleeves. I had an even number of stitches, and not only did I have an even number of stitches, I had a different even number of stitches. <laughs> I had something like 26 on one and 28 on the other. I have literally no idea. 
The weird thing was when I looked back down the column of stitches, I couldn't actually see where there was a problem. So it wasn't like I could have dropped down and, and picked something up. I have no idea. But I decided that because that column of increases is such a big feature that I wanted it to be as close to perfect as possible. And so rather than just getting towards the end and trying to fudge the numbers when I got up to the underarm, I just thought, no, just, just take it back, just do it again. It was something like five hours of work to get it back to that point. But, you know, I'd rather have it looking as perfect as I can just because it is such a big feature of the top of that sweater. So yeah, that is my current work in progress. And I'm not really working on anything else. I'm trying to be a bit monogamous to this. It would be really nice to try and get this finished for Christmas, but I don't know whether that will happen or not. It's very busy for me this time of year. Um, it's very busy at work. And when I get home, a lot of times I'm, I'm just like, Ugh, I just can't be bothered to do anything. <laughs> which is terrible, but it does mean that I don't get a lot of progress. On the same day as I picked the stranded dye works order up from the post office, I also picked up a Hilltop Cloud order because it was coming up to the gradient week of 51 yarns and I didn't really have any gradients in stock to work on during that episode. So I ordered one of her gradients and I also um, ordered another lot of her sock yarn base as well. So, this is the gradient and so this is actually a finished spin because when I went to my knitting group, uh, my spinning group rather, on the, when was that, the Wednesday night, I didn't actually have anything to spin. So I thought I'd better think of something fast and this was what I thought of. So this has now been washed and dried and it probably averages out at roughly, I'm going to say probably about a DK weight. So that one is beautiful. She does have, I think, a couple more braids of that type of fiber. Um, she did an update the other day, but I missed the color that I would have gone for again. <laughs> and the other fiber that I got was this rather fabulous rainbow self-striping, <laughs> which is very, very cool. This is a, a mirror dyed, version um, so in theory you could split this into two and do three ply um, like chain plied socks or something out of it and this is a base that I've worked with before which is a 70% superwash cheviot 15% um, silk 15% nylon I worked on that with the fractal spun and also the self striping weeks of 51 yarns so I'm familiar with how that spins up and I might try and get it a little bit thinner this time because the, uh, the previous times it's been a tiny bit thick, which is fine because I like a good thick sock yarn for socks to wear around the house, but it would be kind of cool to get a little bit thinner when I do this one. And then the other thing that I also bought at the same time was Hilltop Cloud's um, sample card. I do have a sample card already. The, the benefit of this one is being able to actually attach your samples directly to it. It's got holes cut out to be able to thread your arm through so that you can actually keep your sample card kind of hung on your wheel with all of your different samples attached to it as well. Hey, Dexter, kiss. Kiss, good boy. Kiss. Kiss. Yeah, good boy. Another cuddle. There we go. Uh, this is making it rather difficult for me to actually show you stuff, isn't it? A bit stuck now, though. Oh, there's one other thing that I forgot to mention, which is I just, I had to get Sinister Cat Sweater, Sinister Cat Sweater pin. That's a complete necessity, isn't it? Um, very cute little pin, 
with a cat in a little turquoise jumper with colour work, sinister cats all over it. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, completely love it. There, there were a selection of different pins, but this was the, the one that called to me. There is one final purchase, which is Blackie Yarns Tour. So this is quite an important one because it was basically created by Katie while she worked for Blackie Yarns. She's now gone freelance and that's going uh, very well as far as I'm hearing back from her. And that's fantastic because she totally deserves to have, you know, every um, success with that business. But also she really deserves to be able to live the life that she loves. And if she can do that through her freelance work, then that is fantastic. This is the 13th birthday yarn of Black Yarns. So they have a different birthday yarn each year and it's a limited edition. Once it's gone, it's gone. They're not repeating it. And Tor was their birthday yarn. Katie designed quite a few different patterns to go with it. And it's rather fabulous. I love it. This is an Aran weight and I did say that I was going to have an Aran weight uh, to add to my stash. I did find a pattern that I'm kind of vaguely intending to make with this yarn, although if something else comes along that I think it would also work for, then I'll probably, you know, go with that. The particular pattern that I vaguely have in mind is uh, one that has a little colourwork yoke with a sort of fir tree pattern on it. Um, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name, I'll just put it down here. <laughs> and so that's the vague intention for it, but if something else comes along that I think it would work for, then I may well do that. <sighs> so there we go, that is all of the yarn purchasing that I have been doing recently. I do have two other things that I will probably purchase at some point. Um, one is I really want to do another Strocker sweater and I'll be doing that probably in a teal colour and it will help me use up the grey and yellow that I have left over from my other Strocker. So I literally only need to buy the main body colour. Um, and I'm also going to John Arban, hopefully, on Tuesday, I think. I'm going with Grace from Brabus Travelling Yarns and I will probably do a little bit of yarn purchasing there. I've heard some very good things about Devonia, so it may well be some Devonia and I might get some fibre there as well. But yeah, that's, that's everything. I feel like I now have several sweaters lined up and bar those other two things that I mentioned, I'm not planning on doing any big yarn purchases in the near future. However, I have got those reference photos from Yarnporium for the next time that I feel like I need to stock up on particular types of yarn. So I hope that you found that useful. Um, as I say, it is a lot of purchasing and not a huge amount of knitting. I think the plan of action is to finish them on Mane sweater as quickly as I can and then to move on probably to wool and honey. I should also mention that Katie has also given me um, the extra skeins that she had of the rowing yarn that I'm planning to do the fold lines sweater with. So that's another one that's kind of on the cards. But yeah, one sweater at a time. Let's not try and make things any more complicated than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> so yes, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. I am currently on a week off and I am planning to do lots of 51 Yarns episode filming, hopefully trying to catch up on some of the backlog of episodes that I haven't done so far. So stay tuned for those. Um, in the meantime, you can find me on Instagram as Tiny Fibre Studio and on Ravelry, I'm Ibex. There is a Ravelry group. Somebody did mention the other day they wanted to know whether it was still up and running. It is there if you would like to use it to discuss knitting, spinning, etc. Please feel free to do so. I don't put very much on there myself just because I find it time consuming enough to shoot the videos, edit the videos, do the show notes, do the keywording, uploading to YouTube, putting posts on Instagram, doing thumbnail images, all of that stuff. 
I find that to be enough for me to do. And if I try and get myself to do the Ravelry stuff as well, it's just too much. But please do feel free to use that as a channel to talk to other people about the podcast if you want to. But if you want to leave a comment for me, please do so in the YouTube comments. That's the place that's easiest for me to check. Don't forget to give this a little thumbs up if you enjoyed it and also subscribe if you would like to stay updated when I post future videos. Hope this has been useful and I will see you again very soon. Happy knitting. I'm going to go and pack this stuff up because the cats are currently destroying it.